very attractive to the seller by closing quickly, usually within two to three weeks. And um, it creates a very, very competitive offer. Um, it creates an offer that, you know, speaking to listing agents on weekends or other times, um, the cash offers, we do things um, that I think make it very nice uh, for your buyer and give them an opportunity to, to purchase a home. So um, I'm going to honor my, my short talk here and just let you know that the general rule of thumb that we look for is 5% down in the ability to cover an appraisal gap. Buyers may not always tell you that they have the ability to cover an appraisal gap because they don't want to talk about their retirement. They don't want to talk about maybe family gifts funds or other things, but we're happy to have those conversations with them, and we'd love to have those conversations with you and them at the same time. Uh, Julie and I just had one of those talks uh, on Monday, and I think it went um, really well. Uh, our buyers are kind of in that mentality to submit one offer because, of course, they're going to give you just this weekend too. To buy a house, right? So <laughs> coming out of, and out of town to do that. But um, John, you and I just closed the deal on Monday. Uh, two week close, structured very similar to this. Uh, we just did two week closing. We did no appraisal, no loan. Uh, we had the file clear to close before the inspection was done. So um, you know, we felt very good about it. But uh, please reach out. And I hope I stayed under the time limit. But Brianna is just going to give you a quick tidbit of how to get information about FHA and VA property standards. Thanks for leaving me 30 seconds in here. <laughs> hey, you guys, good to see you. I just wanted to let you know that with rising home prices and rates, we're seeing a lot more FHA loans being used for buyers to finance their purchases. And there are some very special things that go along with FHA and VA loans, particularly with the minimum property standards that are needed um, that are looked at when the appraisal is done. The appraiser is going to look for safety concerns, any hazards when they're doing that appraisal, not just valuing the property. So those are a little bit different. We're getting a lot of questions about those types of loans. I've got the minimum property standards for both FHA and VA that I can email to you. So send me an email and I'll send those off to you so you can get familiar with those requirements. Also, FHA and VA have a database that is public, online, and searchable for condos. Condo projects need to be approved by FHA and VA for financing to be possible with any condo unit. And if you have any questions about how to do condo checks, or you want us to double check for you to make sure that a condo project is approved with FHA or VA, we're here to do those for you, whether we're working with your client or not. So definitely give me a call if you have any questions about those. I can send the links to those databases. If you don't have them, you just let me know what you guys need. That's all I got. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, we do, we'll start our Monday talks again. Stacey, we, and I need a little break. Uh, so we'll start those Monday talks again on this coming Monday. Stacey, thanks. I think so. Okay, so she's doing she's doing a marathon on Sunday. She's doing whole fast Sunday. So maybe yeah, she might. Amir and I will do Monday talk, and, I can, and, and we'll go over this one in, in more depth. So yeah, thanks guys. One last sponsor we do have. Doug Fast here. Uh, I know many of you guys use him for home inspections. Uh, does an amazing job, and it's just nice to see you in person, Doug. It's been a few years, so uh, a quick hello. Hello, nice to see everybody. Um, thanks for calling the stage. I'm just going to spend just a few minutes talking about some new legislation that's hitting my industry uh, this summer, which will impact you all as well. So, um, and just. For those of you that, that don't know me, um, I, I'm done fast with home building inspections. I've been doing inspections for about 19 years. So, though I didn't start when I was 15. I know you're <laughs> um, anyways, we're, we're a fairly small group. Um, there's myself, one other inspector. I like Gina, who's in the back, who really kind of keeps everything running smoothly. And, uh, you know, we have a real commitment to serviceability. The, Timely and excellent community 
education. We try to be as detail-oriented, but keep things very um, rational for your clients as well. So we try to have an even keel when we're doing those inspections. But um, the last thing I'll mention, which kind of ties into um, the points we're going to be talking about, is we're, we're very um, interested in making sure we're up to date and and um, doing everything we need to be in terms of continuing education, association, certifications, all that kind of stuff. Um, we're always a part of either ASHI or InterNACHI in terms of the, the National Home Inspector groups. Um, I'm a level one thermographer. My other inspector um, is a certified radon, um, certified residential thermographer. And um, we also pass the National Home Inspector exam, which is important because in Colorado, we're one of the few states where there is no licensing requirements for home inspectors. So, um, and that exam is actually what most states use uh, for the licensing. So I, I make sure that anybody that works with us does that. So, so uh, to get over to the other topic today, which is the licensing change, which hits our um, our particular group or our particular industry this year, is beginning July 1st, uh, there is going to be a requirement for licensing for radon testing. Um, so it's interesting that, like I just mentioned, there's no licensing for home inspectors, but you know, let's let's move on to licensing for radon testing. I'm I'm certainly a proponent that we have licensing for, for both those two, but um, at some point that will probably happen. So so what this entails is basically anybody that's doing either mitigation or measurement for radon testing um, is going to have to be. Um, First of all, certified through the National Radon Proficiency Program uh, or the National Radon Safety Board. Um, so either one of those two things works, and then you have to um, finish kind of the application process through DORA. And um, what that entails, basically, those two associations that you have to be certified through have all kinds of steps and requirements that you have to do. You have to Prove that you're um, first of all using proper equipment, equipment that's approved by um, the American Society of um, Radon Scientists and Technologists. A lot of acronyms. I, I, I don't love all the acronyms, but um, so you have to uh, do calibrations on those equipment every year. Um, you have to make sure that you're proficient and and do one of a couple things that shows your proficiency in the equipment and the testing and the uh, reading results, all that kind of stuff. There are CE requirements. Um, so there's a number of steps that you have to go through in terms of, of doing that, and there's lots of money involved with, with paying for that as well. So, um, so the new legislation, it's interesting, 90% of it really is talking about, you know, um, what the disciplinary actions are if you don't have it. <laughs> so there's a lot of um, a lot of disciplinary actions that will come about for people that aren't doing it. But what this means for you all is that um, you know, beginning in July, um, you know any home inspectors that are doing radon testing as part of their process um, really should be licensed, and um, that. So that is something that's um, that's going to be a requirement at least for the next 10 years. So um, our group, we've already sent in our applications. We've been a member of NRPP, which is National Radon Proficiency Program, for years. Um, so you know, come Jan July 1st, we'll be hitting the ground running for us. Um, and what that means really for you is your clients as well are you know having somebody that's Making sure you're doing everything properly in terms of the whole radon testing, measurement, and communication of those results to your clients. So, um, it's like I said, it's going to be happening July 1st. Um, I will tell you right now if you look at the list of home inspectors that are on the National Radon Proficiency Program, it's a very small percent versus the number of home inspectors that are in Colorado. So right now, there's a pretty small percentage of home inspectors 
that are kind of following this protocol. So just kind of an FYI for you, that might be some questions that you might want to talk to your folks about um, if you're using um, a home inspection group. And um, if you've got any questions about any of that stuff, you know, please feel free to give us a holler. We're, we're happy to, to answer any questions you might have about that. So thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of your evening. One more round of applause for Doug and for Alpine Loans who came in clearly to take care of us. And now, Scott Peterson, who is the attorney for the Colorado Association of Realtors, who mans the table hotline. So when I had a question that you guys could give to me, and I know the answer, this is the gentleman I call, and he does amazing talks around the state for us. Scott Peterson, thanks for having me. Thanks, Tom and Stacy, for inviting me here. I'm going to figure out where my audio is not. I'm going to reverberate the room. Um, I appreciate the invitation to come here. What a great group. It's nice to see everybody in person, once again, more actively than we were for a long, long time. I'm going to quickly, as both sponsors said things that triggered in my head a little bit. And so uh, I'll start with our property inspector, who uh, thanks for sponsoring. But anytime, I've always said this. Uh, and, and he said without any prodding, but anytime I ask, uh, or the broker asks me about the quality property inspector, I say, well, ask them if they want to be regulated or licensed. And if they tell you no, then you might need to find another property inspector. So he jumped right out and said that he'd like to see home inspector licensing, and uh, I certainly agree. I think the Colorado Association of Realtors certainly agrees with that. No one will assume. I think maybe we'll get there with the radar inspection or radar licensing and so forth. And then my other friends back here, uh, I got a question. I'm going to put you guys on the spot because I'm actually curious about this. If you guys know in the new contract that came out this year, uh, we emphasize in a blank now there's a dollar amount that you've got to fill out when you're doing an FHA or VA loan for uh, uh, things that aren't allowed to be paid by the buyer. Right? And it's not to exceed a certain dollar amount. And I'm hearing, uh, since that blank has been added this year, that a lot of, there, there really weren't. Uh, too many things that a buyer can't pay in connection with the VA or FHA loan in terms of in terms of uh, prepays. Is that what you guys are seeing? The main idea is that there's no interest in party contributions. No interest in party contributions is the main one. So in that blank in the contract, what would you recommend putting in terms of dollar amount not to exceed? And I know I'm putting on the spot. Uh, I would say not to exceed three percent. Okay, not to exceed three percent. I get a lot of questions about that. I've never had really a great answer. Uh, I say three grand, but I don't know if that's a great answer or not. Sometimes that's uh, that's uh, maybe. Well, in Colorado, I think that that does not exceed three percent anymore at this point. It's uh, with values, it's a drop in the bucket. But anyhow, uh, okay, well. Good to see everybody. I am doing my potpourri, risk management potpourri. I don't know how to. There, that's gone now. Uh, that's potpourri right there. That's my entire slide. You look at that beautiful dish of assorted dried flowers and herbs. It smells nice, doesn't it? We I did this uh, a few weeks ago, actually, on April 20th in uh, at our Colorado Spring Summit in Vail. Has anybody ever been there? You've heard of our Colorado Spring Summit? Thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> They're waiting for you. Then Wendy was there. I figured mean, she was there. And you saw this. The next slide I had after this, because it was April 20th, was, was a big dish of Colorado marijuana, to my quick read. <laughs> for 420. And, uh, but I took it out because I figured I don't need to be you know, pushing all of that. Um, so this is my entire slide for the entire class. And for those of you who haven't seen me do what I've called quick read the last couple of years, I literally update this. I, I put that last bullet point in there literally yesterday morning. So, and then I delete stuff as it goes. But this is meant to be an interactive class. Those are topics that I like to talk to you guys about. I'm happy to talk to you about any of those things. But I'm also happy to talk to you about anything that you guys would like to talk about in the entire world for as long as these two will give me to talk here. Uh, but those are just some recommended topics. And if somebody wants to raise your hand and tell me which one of those you'd like to hear about first, or Anything else you'd like to hear about first, I'll start going from there. 
Design Works Homes Lawsuit. Design Works Homes Lawsuit. This is a new one. Uh, that was the one I added second most recently uh, because this is kind of a breaking issue that is going to have potentially some interesting implications. So, Design Works Homes is an architecture firm that's back east somewhere. I don't know even exactly where, where they were, but a very high end architecture firm. They, they, they design, from an architectural standpoint, very, very high end homes. And one of these super high-end homes had this gorgeous atrium that they designed years ago. And it was very architecturally significant. It's a beautiful atrium. It's built into presumably a you know, multi-multi-million dollar home. And the seller all over that home just uh, years later, now this is still a couple of years ago now because it's been going through the courts, years later, uh, listed their home. And one of the MLS photos that their roots were used was obviously a picture of this gorgeous atrium in this home. The picture was taken by the resident by a professional photographer, so it wasn't taken by the architecture firm. They didn't use any of the design plans, the schematics, the, the architectural plans that would be the intellectual property that presumably belonged to design works. They just took a picture of an atrium that was in an existing house that design works had designed years before. And guess what? Design works stepped up and said, you can't use that picture. That's all intellectual property. That atrium is so unique and designed by us that even though you own the rights to the picture, and maybe the seller, certainly the seller owns the home and the atrium, we believe we have an intellectual property interest or copyright interest in the design of the atrium. You can't use it in the listing photos. So we made the realtor as well as the seller in the lawsuit for an intellectual property right or copyright infringement. Okay? So uh, they, they sued the seller of the realtor in the federal district court, and the federal district court finds on behalf of the seller of the realtor saying, of course, this is something that exists in the home, and they ought to be able to take a picture of their home and market that home and use it in the less listing photos and so on and so forth. So they went to the district court level. Design works appeals, and the appeals court overturns the decision and finds in favor of design works, the architecture firm. Saying there is some intellectual property values of that that you own, and the seller and listing broker should be able to use this. So now the popular they call out the United States Supreme Court has taken up the issue, and they will be hearing it, I think, next fall as part of their regular agenda. So to the extent that possibly design works is is found uh, or a finding is favorable to, to design works at the United States Supreme Court level, think about the potential implications from Builders, architecture, architects, uh, potentially engineers, the trades that go into building a home and their ability to exert an intellectual property right over something that they designed and built for somebody but no longer have an actual ownership interest in the thing. Right? So just something more to keep an eye on going forward, uh, and we'll see, we probably won't hear a, 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 a final Supreme Court decision on that for you know probably almost a full year at this point. Um, but it does, with the appeal overturning the original decision on the appellate court level, it creates a really interesting uh, sort of theory that we're going to see explored at the United States Supreme Court level that uh, you guys or it could have an impact on your business and your use of photos and elements of the facade of the house, the interior design of the house. I mean, who knows where that begins and ends, quite honestly. So keep an eye on that one. That's a shorter topic. Give me a yeah. What is the status of the lawsuit on the um, collaborative brokerage issue? Sure. Antitrust lawsuits. There's three, well, there's two now. Uh, class action lawsuits that have been filed uh, against NAR, uh, REMAX, uh, Home Services, Real G, and Keller Williams with five main defendants. Home Services and Real G are massive, you know. Franchisors, a lot of brands. Those, five, those four franchisors comprise it's like 68 or 70 percent of the total realtor population in the United States of America. And then, of course, MAR National Association of Realtors is the primary name responded in that matter. Uh, they all hold that. So, two seller lawsuits and one buyer lawsuit that are out there. The con contention on the seller lawsuits are based in, fe in federal antitrust law. And they're basically saying that for years, NAR and those franchisors, through NAR's NLS policies, 
you know, MLS has a, or the NAR has an MLS policy committee, and the board of directors of MLS or, or the NAR promulgate policies that have to be adopted by every grocery owned MLS in the United States of America. One of those policies is the mandatory offer of compensation that flows through the MLS to control. You can rely, if you're an MLS participant, on the listing broker's offer of compensation through the MLS to you and whatever dollar amount or percentage may be listed. And there's no such thing as a mandatory minimum offer of compensation, but there has to be a an offer of compensation, and MLS will say it has to be a percentage or a dollar amount, one or the other. Well, with the contention of the sellers and their law firms, there's two law firms that are involved in this. One in Missouri, one in Chicago. Uh, the contention of the sellers and their law firms is that what has what has naturally occurred through that mandatory offer of compensation over generations, literally like 50, 60 years, that has been policy, what has naturally occurred or evolved is a mandatory minimum offer of compensation. Now, I don't want to hear numbers in the room, even though you guys are all part of the same brokerage firm. If you could talk numbers, I still just as a policy, I don't want to hear any numbers. But I think most of you have some number in mind that you believe is the sort of uh, commission that if you're going to bring buyers to a listing, you are being receiving. And that there lies the problem with the basis of the seller's allegation in this class action or these proposed class action lawsuits. So um, the the gist of them are sellers have been harmed because they have been forced to pay a mandatory minimum offer of compensation to a cooperating buyer or broker, and that's that's occurred because of collusion between NAR and the principles or the historical principles of those four franchisors for generations. Now, one of the lawsuits is filed in Chicago, and the law firm, federal class action lawsuits are driven by law firms. Right? They're not, there's no individual plaintiffs that are really behind it. There's named plaintiffs. And in this case, it's a, a guy named Christopher Merrill, who was a seller in Minneapolis years ago, uh, that is the named plaintiff. But the law firm that's representing Mr. Mar Merrill, Merrill, I think you say, uh, in Chicago is uh, the same exact law firm that took down Big Tobacco two years ago. This is a, this is not Frank Ace on it, right? This is super high power, big time, plain federal class action plaintiff's law firm, incredibly well funded and, uh, and ready for the fight. And any office said, we're ready for the fight, we, we've got to have this fight. It goes to the very core of our business. So uh, that one is still pending. We are trying to get class certification, and they will get class certification. Any of us filed motions to dismiss that lawsuit as well as the four response. Those motions to dismiss have been denied, and now they have to obtain class certification, which means once they get that, they can start building their class of potential plaintiffs. And this is a federal class action lawsuit where we talk about mesothelioma or roundup litigation or big, big tobacco litigation or any of those kinds of things where you see commercials and advertising to try and build that class then once the law firm obtains class certification. An identical law lawsuit was filed a few months later. This was about three years ago now in Missouri, a federal district court in Missouri. Identical respondents, different law firm, different set of plans, but identical allegations. And that one just about three weeks ago did obtain class certification in Missouri. So there's every reason to leave one in Chicago or one in the federal district court will obtain that as well. So they're pending, and they're going to continue. And, and once they get their class certification, they'll start to they're, they're going through the discovery process right now. Uh, one of the NLSs that they are uh, uh, they issue a lot of subpoenas to is you're probably there, many of your NLS that you've already called out. Uh, I think last I heard, already called out, it's spent over like $120,000 in production of documents so far on this thing. So it's a big deal and it's going to impact our industry potentially in pretty significant ways. It's going to be a uh, fight that NARs have to undertake to fight to. Preserve that offer of compensation through the MLS for potentially many years to come uh, in both of those. The, just to close the lawsuit part of that discussion, there was another, and I say there was three as of about a week ago, and now there's only two, because there was also a lawsuit been filed by uh, a law firm in the same federal district court in Illinois. This one reporting to represent buyers who said, We've been harmed as well. Not only have sellers been harmed, the buyers have been wrong because of this compensation policy, and because what has occurred naturally over this time is artificially inflated cooperating broker or buyer broker commissions. And even though the seller has to pay those commissions, we as buyers have been wrong because that is artificially inflated the purchase price of the homes of the buyer. Makes sense, right? No. Well, 
unfortunately, as of uh, about a week ago, Dr. Levy, it was a week ago today, Wednesday, I was in D.C. when this all came out, the federal district court in Illinois dismissed that lawsuit. They said, buyers, you don't have standing. Unfortunately, in the dismissal opinion written by the judge, uh, there was some language that saying, sellers might have awfully good standing under this same theory, which is not a good indication of how the seller lawsuits might fall in those other two courts. Okay? So that's the current status of those three lawsuits uh, that are pending. The other thing, I think more pressing thing, so we're with the class action lawsuits, we're talking 10, 12, maybe 15 years of litigation, and it's been going on for three already. Right? So we're talking about a long, drawn out process. Um, so, you know, those things are going to happen there, we're not sure exactly what, but stay tuned for probably many years on that particular front. The thing that's more pressing, though, is the DOJ and the FTC investigation that are taking place. And as many of you guys recall, uh, the DOJ, shortly after these lawsuits were filed in 2019, they ended up opening, the DOJ ended up opening an investigation into the into the same policies, NARs and NLS policies related to mandatory offers of compensation, and does that harm buyers in some way, or does it harm consumers in some way? Not buyers, sellers, or consumers generally. And so after 18 months of negotiating a full settlement with the Trump DOJ, or the Trump, Trump Attorney General, under, under Trump, uh, they came on and the Department of Justice jointly announced in November, late November, early December of 2020, we've reached a settlement, we've reached an agreement. And here's the basic terms of the agreement, and we're going to sign a final agreement sometime in the first quarter of 2021. Something else changed in Washington, D.C. in 2021, the first quarter. We got, a, we got a new administration, a new attorney general, a new Department of Justice leadership, and everything else. And so they came in and said, deal's off the table. We're not going to sign this. They announced last Jan uh, July 1st of last year, so just less than a year ago now. Deal's off the table. We don't think it's good enough, and we're recommencing our investigation of your industry, and we're adding the Federal Trade Commission to the investigation from a civil standpoint as well. And guys, stay tuned. We'll see what happens. That's essentially where it was left as of July 1st of last year. That is actively going on. They've been firing off what they call, when the DOJ or FTC sends out subpoenas, they're called uh, CIDs or Civil Information Demands. And they've been firing those off. I mean, it is a very hot active investigation. So what happens with that? Is anybody guess? I'm guessing that the results of that probably won't be uh, handed down until sometime after the midterms. Just a guess. Um, but when they are handed down, it could be anything from, you know, immediate, say, immediately saying, hey, the mandatory offer compensation within the MLS is inherently antitrust, it is harmful to consumers, and it goes away immediately. And that could happen, I mean, that could happen while we're sitting here talking this morning, but I don't think it will. It would probably happen sometime after the midterm elections. So it's not to rock the blame and blow. Uh, so that's going on. And then in response to that, and I'm very proud of NAR for doing this. They sued the Department of Justice and the Biden administration. And they have said basically, as a matter of policy, this is on the merits of the investigation, but as a matter of policy, United States citizens and United States corporations ought to be able to rely on good faith negotiated, fully negotiated agreements with the government. And just because the government changes doesn't mean the agreement should change. Right? So it's, a, it's more of a principle lawsuit on that, and that is currently actively pending uh, in federal district court in, I think, D.C. is where that one is. Uh, so many of us was part of that. I'll give a very quick plug to the reasons for all of those, fighting the lawsuits and fighting the DOJ and FTC investigation. If you're a high broker and you're not participating or investing in our PAC, uh, you're making a mistake. Because if that mandatory offer of compensation through the NLS goes away for buyer brokers, guess who pays? Not the seller. I mean, maybe in some ways. It doesn't mean the seller could. It just means they're not mandated. But in every other first world country in the world where real estate transactions happen like ours without a mandatory offer of compensation, there's either one broker involved, a listing broker in a transaction, or the buyer pays their own broker. And guess what average commissions for buyer brokers are? I'll use this number because it came right out of the mobile lawsuit. Average buyer broker commissions in the rest of the developed world are like 0.48%. Because buyers can't afford 
will pay their own broker. Right? They don't have cash and clothes they could go kind of make check their their own broker. So they end up not using one, or they end up paying a dramatically it's a race to the bottom in terms of buyer recognition. So that's kind of what's at stake here, in my view, in both the lawsuits which are challenging that as well as this DOJ FTC investigation. So anyhow. I'm going to do the update. I'm sorry to give you that. But <laughs> no, that's, 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 all, that's all true story. So, stay tuned on both of those Next question. Anything up there? Anything else? Let's do new contract issues. Paul, mm -hmm. I love contracts and answer a lot of questions. So. <laughs> new contract issues. So, what I put there is 15, 3, and 16, 2. There's, there's two, two areas that have caused, uh, what I would say, uh, disproportionately high consternation. With regard to the new 2022 contracts that you guys just got, purchase and sale contracts. One of them is that I'm alluding to there, 15.3 and 16.2, and this is a good teaching point. You guys are well managed and run well, so you guys are probably already on this, but I had a ton of confusion related to the status letter section of paragraph 15 versus the uh, association assessments section that all comes under paragraph 16. Uh, both of these have to do with uh, CIC or community uh, properties, uh, uh, CIC community, uh, let's see, what's the other uh, common interest? Common interest, interest community, that's why I'm screwing up, because I'm starting the community. The common interest community documents. So we're talking about the common interest community. Under 15.3, we kind of finagle the language a little bit and we put a checkbox for, it says associate, it says associations assessments paid in advance working capital and reserves. Okay, this is 15.3. Alright. That is now, that is a checkbox and you can check who's going to pay for those. The problem with, and then 16.2, of course, is the association assessments down below. And that goes to special assessments as well as the prorogation of assessments paid in advance. But those are regular assessments paid in advance. So the special assessment piece hasn't been confused, and that's still in the same spot. But the concept of associate assessments paid in advance has created confusion because we use the language again in 15.3 up above. So an assessment paid in advance, or a regular assessment paid in advance, would be something like quarterly HOA dues. Homeowner seller pays on January 1st for the first quarter of their HOA dues. And let's say the first quarter is a thousand bucks, just for a round number. And so they pay this on January 1st, they sell their home and close on February 15th. What should happen in that case on a regular assessment is there's a probation. The seller gives a credit from the buyer for 500 lots for the prepaid association's assessments paid in advance. All right. But we also had to use the term assessments paid in advance in 15.3. I wish we hadn't. Because what that really refers to is essentially working capital and or reserves. Right? And this is more of escrow assessments paid in advance. So most associations have some minimum level, I should say, you know, in their bylaws they have to maintain at least half a million dollars in working capital reserves assessments paid in advance, whatever you want to call it. And they all call it something different, which is the problem, really. That's what 15.3 is referring to, and who should be paying them? The buyer. Every single time. Because this is the benefit of the buyer. This is the buyer's obligation to put that money up, keep it in escrow. In many cases, what happens, or what should happen, is the seller should get a credit for their, let's say it's $1,000 of, of an assessment paid in advance or a working capital or reserve. And closing, the seller ought to get a credit for $1,000, and the buyer ought to get a credit for $1,000. And that would mean the buyer's paying that, and the seller's getting their money back, because it's just money held in escrow account by the HOA in case something goes wrong and they got to you know, do group for decks or whatever it might be in the common areas, right? So the problem is this, is with the change in the contract now, I'm getting a lot of people that are checking the box, seller pays that. So I'll say this, if you're a buyer agent, you're representing a buyer transaction by an offer, you, I mean, go ahead and check 15 in 15.3 that seller will pay. I, I'm not encouraging this because I think that's not the appropriate result. We shouldn't probably have a checkbox there. It ought to default to buyer will pay that. Because it really is their money that's being held in escrow during their period of ownership to be compliant with the HOA rules and regulations. But here's the real cautionary tale. This is the people that are brokers who are checks at closing or 
deferring some of their commission closing are listing brokers who are accepting contracts or allowing their seller to accept a contract that says seller will pay. Because the seller really shouldn't be paying for those things. So when the broker calls me and I had a ton of these calls saying, well, I'm going to check seller pays, my answer is, your seller's going to pay because that's what the contract says unless the buyer agrees to amend the contract for some reason, which, why would they? Sellers are beating them up about all the transactions it is. Right? So, um, make sure you're listing broker, you're getting offers, and it's a CIC or common interest community property that you're checking that to make sure that it, in 15.3 that it appropriately, appropriately reflects that the buyer will pay. Otherwise, your sellers will be frustrated when they have to. Yeah. In your experience, are the sellers getting a credit at closing, or is it the watch, or is the HOA just coming out of it? It's on the HOA. So the HOAs have over, this is, this is a real problem. So we've got over 10,000 HOAs in the state of Colorado, and we're trying to write a form contract that uses nomenclature that they all use different nomenclature in. And that's why when they put in associate or assessments paid in advance up in 15.3, it's because some of them refer to their working capital or reserves as assessments paid in advance. They created that conflict. So the other part of it is, is it's whether or not the seller gets back their credit for that at closing is based on the rules or bylaws or of the HOA. And so many of them are different. But many of them do say, you put your money in, you get your money out at, at closing. And they do actually, they really should get a credit for their money back. Oh, of course. We currently have an in-house transaction going between agents. I'm on one end, my side, the other parties on the other. And there is a pending special assessment that has been held up because the lawsuit that was just recently resolved with the insurance company there has not been a vote on uh, whether or not uh, what the size of the special assessment would be. If that vote does not occur before closing, how might the credit be I think buyer probably pays for the assessment. It's a disclosure issue, right? So the question is this, you've got a you've got a top property under contract, there's this news of a potential special assessment floating around during the contract period, yet it hasn't been assessed. And of course the contract would say in most cases that assessments that occur prior to closing, if assessed, are the seller's responsibility and then anything after is buyer's responsibility. In your situation, the, the vote or the actual assessment, and people ask me all the time, what does assessment mean? I say it's kind of a drop in the gallery, right? In other words, when there's a board meeting and the board you know, makes a motion and they have a second and they call for a vote, and when they say, yes, assess, boom, you know, that's the assessment, that's the point. So if that doesn't occur prior to the close of the transaction, then I think what typically would occur is it's part of responsibility. Yeah, in this situation, unfortunately, the, uh, there's a letter issued by the HOA that says the attorneys will send the documents for both. Well, all you do is disclose that to the seller, and obviously disclose that letter to the buyer, and the buyer could obviously negotiate a change to that, or some, the buyer and seller can negotiate something. But at the end of the day, and, and I think the buyer could probably terminate if they if they didn't want to proceed because I think that disclosure would be an adverse material fact or a new disclosure of an adverse material fact which would give that it's five days after they receive that or closing whichever is later. So I think the buyer could terminate, seller could negotiate something else or you know it, it, but with nothing else involved, I think it's gonna be the buyer's responsibility. Cool. Thanks. Okay. All right. And what's the next uh, topic up here? Bridge cash fire. Bridge cash buyer, that's uh, another phenomenon that I love about the incredible real estate market. But I, I like to hear that. I think I'm getting the same sense. You guys are probably getting the same sense that things are tempering a little bit. Maybe a little bit more of a level playing field. Maybe not every offer needs to be a cash offer. So, what's the uh, material for the last few years out of this crazy market that you guys have all been living and working in? Is uh, sellers are demanding cash offers, and buyer or P is going to have to make a cash offer. Most buyers or many buyers aren't capable of performing cash offers. So there's been a cottage industry that you call them uh, bridge cash buyer. I say, you know, what they mean by the cash buyer, you guys know what I'm talking about. There's a handful of companies, a growing handful of companies, right? And this may stay around for some reason. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, so it presents some issues or some interesting issues that you guys need to be thinking about. The first challenge is, is every company does it a little bit differently. But, but I don't, none of them that, that I'm aware of is a simple assignment from the buyer to the closing interest, entity or the closing entity to the buyer. It's not an assignment of the contract. In most cases, it's two closings, 
right? The 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 really main buyer cash buyer company, which is usually a lender, will close with their money on transaction one very quickly for cash with the seller, and then they'll put in permanent financing uh, and underwriting with your buyer to close on the second transaction, you know, weeks or a month later or whatever it is, in a more normal kind of time frame. Right? So issues that arise with this or with this model, and I'm not I'm not knocking them all, they all do it differently and some of them probably are better than others and I haven't really looked into the ton of the, how everybody's doing it, but things for you guys to be thinking about are this. When you when you're representing your buyer and your buyer is engaged with one of these companies to close quick for cash on their behalf, who writes the contract? Typically. You do, right? Does anybody know one of these deals? Nobody's ever used these companies. Well, they all go there. So typically what happens, in fact, I think in every case I know of any of the companies, what happens is the group representing the buyer writes the contract with the with the entity, the real entity cash buyer, will pay by our cash buyer company as the buyer. You write the contract on the commission group form you present it to the seller. That's the model that all will use. What's your brokerage relationship with this company? You don't have one. When you have a brokerage relationship, you have no authority right you're practicing law if you're using the commissioner proof forms. If you're writing a contract on behalf of a party, in order to use the commissioner proof forms, you guys have a license law, there's no state rules, you have to have a broker relationship in order to use the forms with one party or the other or both. Well, in that case, on that contract, you have a relationship with the buyer, and you don't have a relationship with the seller. So you're practicing law when you write the contract. So you've got to make sure you establish a broker relationship with that bridge buyer. In some form or fashion, I would I would prefer a transaction broker, right? Because they probably don't need or want their agency or fiduciary responsibility. So being their TV is probably fine, but you have to have a broker relationship in order to prepare a contract on their behalf. And that often doesn't have a hearing finding. So be mindful of that piece of it. Uh, the next thing that occurs and is problematic is um, so you work you work as a let's say as a TV. With this bridge buyer, close the transaction, and then they go into underwriting with your actual buyer. So now there's going to be a second closing, and presumably a second contract. Who do you represent in that second transaction? Your buyer is who your relationship with is with. That's, who, that's how you got involved in this whole damn thing to begin with, right? But you just finished the transaction with the, on the exact same property as a sometimes agent, but preferably TV, with this. Buyer who's now a seller, selling it to your buyer, who you're probably an agent for. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a broker's relationship issue. Something needs to occur. Now, the good news is, is most of these companies don't care, but you need to clearly end your relationship with that company, your broker's relationship, and you need it to establish in order to write the contract to begin with. You've got to end that, and then you've got to give a broker's disclosure to seller for sale by owner to that same cash buyer or the bridge buyer saying that you're an agent for your buyer or a TV for your buyer, whatever it is, and you're going to treat them either as a TV, continue to treat them as a TV, or you're going to be an agent for your buyer and you're going to treat, them, treat the seller as a customer. But that broker's disclosure to seller now has to exist. And it's a weird change in relationship because again, you've just finished the transaction representing them on the exact same purchase. All right? So as you're doing these things, you've got to be clear in your head about the brokerage relationships. You've got to be clear in your paperwork about the brokerage relationships. Because I don't think there's anything wrong with these businesses, but they don't fully contemplate all of the nuances of our license law, specifically our brokerage relationships license law. And let me point something else out to you. Let's say that, uh, well, let me finish that thought. The second contract, you're probably not right. Because in most cases, as these, as these business models go, they're not on commission of group form. They're prepared by the now seller, bridge buyer, and presented to your buyer, but they're not commission approved contracts. Which means what? You're not licensed to advise your buyer on the contract to begin with. And these contracts are just like a home builder contract, right? It's, a, it's not a commission of group form. And they're often even more complicated than that because many of them incorporate all of the financing, the mortgage, and the underwriting into that same document. Because remember, that seller is typically a lender in that case as well. So you also have to be clear with your buyer your limits in terms of your practice ability to advise them 
on the closing of that second transaction if it's not a commission approved form. And I'm not aware of any of the views of commission approved form on that second transaction. All right, so all those things. I'll put another thing out, another issue that I've seen come up on this is these bridge buyers. So let's say the bridge buyer closes on the first transaction with the seller. Seller doesn't disclose something to the bridge buyer, some condition of the property, there's some problem with the property. So bridge buyer closes. Your buyer then closes, buying from the bridge buyer, moves in and realizes problem with the property, but it's closed. Can your buyer now sue the original seller? No privy. No privy whatsoever. So your buyer's ultimate ability to recover for deficiencies in the property that were not disclosed by the original seller, even if they know that they weren't disclosed. Or even if they knew that they could prove that the seller had actual knowledge of these issues, your buyer doesn't have any ability to have any recourse against the seller. And there's sure some not going to sell or sue the bridge buyer, because I'm sure the agreement between the buyer and the bridge buyer tells them that they can't. So that's another issue, is condition of property issues that the ultimate buyer, your client, when they finally close and move in and they realize there's problems, they don't have any, any money to go after. So another thing to be thinking about for your buyers to be thinking about. And the devil is in the details in that case of that agreement between the bridge buyer and your buyer, not the purchase contract, but the original agreement that they enter into at the time before the bridge buyer even closes on the property. And again, another document that you can't advise buyers on because it's not a mission approval. Okay? So be thinking about all these things as your buyers are trying to you know, find creative ways to compete in the marketplace. We have not obvious business models, but they are all a little bit different and they do create some issues for you guys as you're working through them. Any more topics? No one? It's a clause. Property fraud. That's a good one. That's actually that might be my second. So sell my house, I did land, land property fraud, and then design works I added, I think, was just before that. So that's that. even a fresher topic. Uh, this is a crazy situation that's blown up. I've never seen a scam blow up in the real estate industry like this one that's blown up over the last month. I got a call to start off about, about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago. I was, I knew I was sitting, I was getting ready to go and do a presentation for a REMAX office, and, uh, and I was sitting in my car on like Main Street Bowl, and, and I was talking to somebody who was calling me from Preston, who wrote a book right now well, and she said to me this, she's like, I don't even know the story. I say, well, I hear that a lot on my mind, and rarely am I, you know, rarely does the story keep up, but this one I actually did. So, and this was the first that I heard about the scam. So this is where the property, vacant land down in Crested Butte, so vacant lot, residential vacant lot. And um, one of her local associates in her office, the woman I was talking to, closed the transaction with the buyer, was working with the buyer, and the buyer identifies a property that was not listed on the MLS. It was a for sale by owner property listed on Zillow or Pick Your Syndication website. And the buyer finds it. Because you know, all the buyers are Googling, you know, no matter how much information you send them, they're finding their own, right? So the buyer identifies this piece of data and says, hey, look at this, sends it to the broker, says, I want to see this. Put it in the value, it looks like. Come right in my bed house, and it's a physical property, so it wasn't on the MLS. And so the broker starts to look into it, they contact the seller who's in New York in this particular case. Seller so is, uh, you know, articulate, says, hey, I'm going to work with brokers. Happy to pay you a commission, present me an offer. Where it presents an offer, on behalf of the buyer, the seller accepts it. They go to closing and close the transaction. Closed by a, by what I would say is the most prominent title company in the state of Colorado. So this was not a mom and pop title that just missed something. Closes the transaction, pretty quick close. And so the broker who's working with this buyer then gets a call about three days later from somebody who says, hey, you just work with the buyer selling a property to a, a, to your buyer, and the seller was a friend of mine, and they said you did a great job on this transaction. And I've got a lot as well, and I got you listed for me. Same community, same area. So she says, absolutely, this was fantastic. Happy to take your listing. She goes puts a sign in the yard, puts it on the MLS, gets an offer, 
puts it under contract with her seller now, it's representing a different seller but the same area, puts it under contract, gets a phone call from somebody who says, what in God's green earth are you doing with your real estate sign selling my big piece of land in Crescent View? And her heart drops, obviously. Right? So, it all kind of comes around. In the meantime, so that one was under contract. In the meantime, she had another person can come along and say, hey, I'd like you to sell my lot as well. Another person, probably the same couple of people who are doing all of this. So think about how this, also, this scam plays out. This blew my mind. I mean, we, talk, we still talk about right? it. Most people still have a lot of product advisory on their email signatures, right? Every title company. And that's a good thing, because that's a little legitimate thing. And it's still good now and everything else. But that's an incredibly complicated scam, right? You've got to scoop an email. You've got to follow a transaction. You've got to wait. Or the scammer has to wait until they get to the very end and then send that wire instruction right at the right time to get everybody. It's a, that's a nuanced scam. It takes a long time. This one is perfect. I'm not encouraging any of you guys to try and pull this off. <laughs> this one is perfect. So the scammer goes out and finds vacant property. I, I, I've heard about trying to do it on vacant home. The problem with the home, though, is you've got to do inspections. You've got a little bit more stuff to do, right? You've got to get access to the property, and that really walks things up. But a vacant piece of land, they go out and figure out who the property owner is. And typically, it's going to be an individual. One person that's owned individually. And here's the key there's no gap or encumbrances. It's got a clean title, it's owned outright. Because this could get screwed up if there had to be loan payments. The lender's going to go, hmm, what's going on here? Owned an outright piece of vacant land that doesn't have any access issues, presumably someplace moderately remote, like a resort town in Crescent View, although I'll get to the rest of the story in a second. And they act as the seller. And how do they act as the seller? I'll tell you quickly, I'm embarrassed that I lose this, but I have three kids. One of them is now 21, actually. Uh, my 19 year old daughter is 21 in the state of Washington. My 17 year old son, this is what I'm most embarrassed about, is 21 in the state of Texas. <laughs> and they have these identification cards that were purchased online from China. They got two of them for 80 bucks. And I'm telling you, you can hold them up to an actual identification card and you can't tell the difference. I've got a niece who's in, who's in California and she has a fake Colorado ID. And I held up my Colorado ID and right now there's a little hologram on there. It is nearly perfect. Right? So think about how easy it is for somebody to find the name of somebody who owns property that's unencumbered, have an ID created in three weeks for about 80 bucks, shipped here from time to get to it. <laughs> and they close as the seller because it's going to be a remote closing. That's another characteristic, right? Because it's this person in, in that case in press view, the seller is in New York. So the, the title company does a mail out closing. This person is either taking their fake ID to a real notary and getting notarizations, or they're just buying a notary stamp, probably from China as well. This fake notary stamp sends it back and closes the deal. Now, how simple is that scam? So that was three weeks ago, I think, right about maybe four weeks ago after tomorrow, it was Thursday morning, it feels closer to four weeks, when I got that original call. I had probably 12 other uh, of these issues percolate up in that in the meantime. In Pueblo, in Evergreen, in uh, Steamboat Springs, in Fort Collins, all over the state, this scam. So we work, I, I just worked with uh, my counterpart, uh, uh, Brianna Downey, who's the general counsel of Land Title, as well as Land Title Association of Colorado, and we managed Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and we sent out a joint advisor just last week from Colorado and others, basically saying, hey, guys, if this kind of weird set of circumstances comes up, and, and, and typically it's going to be vacant property, it's going to be really well priced, right? A little bit too good for this market, so they find the buyer quickly. And um, out of state seller, mail out closings. If those scenarios are kind of going on, seems a little bit too good to be true, you guys are going to be on that. You need to pay attention to this. Now, the buyer that actually closed is going to have a pretty good title on it, I think. They're going to be kind of check and probably dealing with that. Um, that's the only one I'm aware of that's actually closed at this point. But the prevalence of them trying to pull this off throughout the state is actually very active in 
a very short period of time. So uh, I just saw yesterday that the FBI now has been assigned to the matter, and so they're also involved, involved because it's very likely these scammers are not you know, residing within Colorado. They're, you know, who knows where they are. And so the FBI is now involved. Uh, but do be cautious of this if you run across a metro area. You know, you could find some vacant dirt or something. Maybe, maybe you could have a little vacant property, but that's going to be a little bit harder to pull off that scam. If you've got to access it for showings or for inspections or those kinds of things. But hey, yeah. Do you know of those um, companies that advertise insurance to prevent this from happening? Or does that actually work? So, what you're talking about is the kind of title off stuff. I don't think it does any good. I think that stuff's kind of scam, frankly. Um, so, here, well, I'll, give you, I'll give you a better way to handle that. Um, so, part of the title insurance. Is that you wouldn't know until your property had been recorded as sold, that it would trigger them to notify you saying, hey, your property is sold. Like, that's what that insurance says, is it monitors county records, or the clerk and recorder's office. And it says, oh, but at that point, you're like, well, thanks for telling me, my property's been sold. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the best thing is this is a really useful tool for all of you guys. I talked about this a few years ago in connection with, we were getting a lot of rental scams on Craigslist with your listings. Where you know you take listing photos, somebody, some scammer would see your new listing. They would take a couple of your listing photos and put an ad on Craigslist saying for rent, and they would induce potential tenants to give them a deposit or do something based on your information, your property information. And so there's a very simple and free tool out there for any of you guys to use. I, mean, I haven't set my own property addresses, but Google Alerts, totally free. Put in your address. And so in this case, in that for the land deal on Crespi that, that I mentioned, when, when, a, when a fake seller lists something on Zillow, you're going to get an alert when that, your property address pops up, right? And that's an easy way to combat that, much better than title lock insurance or whatever. I think it's good to have a standing, and I, I, at the time I was encouraging brokers, and I still would if you guys have listings, put in Google Alerts, if you've got a listing that your name is attached to, and there's marketing or advertising or Google results that are coming up new, you want to know about that, I think, right? So as a matter of your normal course of business, if you're a listing broker, I think you pop in the Google Alert setup one for during your listing period for your listed property address is, is good for you to be paying. You don't know if somebody's misusing it, if other brokers are using it outside of your authorization or outside of syndication sites. Any of those things is probably pretty helpful, but I think it would be helpful in this particular situation as well. Quick question. Yeah. So going back to that original scenario, the uh, listing agent, the agent who took the listing, did she ever get paid originally? So how did they like false law her into submission? Did she get paid? She got paid. She got paid. So so there's a couple of other <laughs> well, so what I, what I think occurs is they use, they somehow they're creating a bank account. Because the they, they, fake seller is going to have to realize the proceeds somehow. So they're going to have to get receive a wire. But again, think about the idea of a, of a fake ID. I mean, you could probably pretty easily scam a bank and open up an account. You don't really need the account for a couple days. You just need long enough to get the money in. And literally within probably an hour, that money has gone to 75 different places around the world. Like just, it's in there and out of there. And so the same outflow of the Brokerage commissions. Well, it just came out and set the proceeds in hand. So the broker got paid by the title company. So in that case, it's, yeah, broker made money on that deal. But yeah, because I'm wondering how did she accept the payment and then take on another listing and then discover that, oh, this is a Because nobody, the, the original seller, there was never a sign in the yard, the seller never did. Okay. So she gets, a days later, she gets another phone call saying, hey, that's my property. And she's like, great. Right. And it wasn't until she put her sign in the yard that the seller happened to actually drop on the bill. What's the sign doing in my yard? In my lawn? That makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's a crazy simple scam, and that's why it's well, I'm so aggressive with it. So I like overthinking. Wow, how did they change the deed so that he could, oh, no, just change her. You're a It's so simple. It's really pretty easy. That's scary. It is. It is. Wow. So, anyhow. <laughs> All right, well, I think I'm going to let you guys go. You, yeah, we got a few things to, to wrap up, so unless there's a very quick, short question why we got the man here. The man. Stop. Give him a hand. Give him a
Yeah, happy to do it. It's tough to get you. Keep you. I'm going to go to my office. So that's nice to meet you. That was good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, let's see. Get my iPad back in here. We have that call. Top of our head. Probably new agents. New agents. Introductions. Introductions. Yep. Let's do it. Yeah. Thanks. You bet, Tom. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah. Yeah, you get I did. That totally unnecessary. Oh, no, no, no. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Good seeing you in person. So, yeah, new agents. If you're a new agent, whether this month or in the last year, you haven't been to a live meeting, <laughs> in person or two years in person meeting, just Stand up and introduce yourself real quick and get your little e pin because you probably haven't gotten an e pin from us yet. Don't be shy of any of it. Do we have anyone new? Like, there's faces I don't recognize, so we'll start back here. Hi, I'm John Pagan. I'm going to be the new developer. You know, this year. Welcome, Jonathan. Here we got you. D. Ellis joined um, in March. Welcome, Dean. Specific. And then Paul and I are going to be, I don't want to 
like, oh, are we really going to do this? We're going to do this. <laughs> we're going to do like mini. They might be a whole hour, but we're going to learn how to do your login and add a person because we already see that we're going to sit there with your computer and we'll probably have some people live and people online. Go up to, you know, you know how these classes go when you're on the computer. Right? Where are you? Where did you go? So it's kind of, you know, patience. But patience, what yeah. patience, what? These will be a little more not asking questions. They're going to be showing you what to do and you follow and learn as much as you can. And if you didn't pick up enough, oh, we've got the same training coming up. I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to do it again. And then they have the online videos, which that's the poem I'm going through right now on learning. And some of you love all my video, that's great, that's fun. And then some of you are like, oh, I can't, it's still that long. So that's why we're going to do some live ones. So, it is June 28th, and stuff is happening. So I'm excited about that. Uh, what's this? I'll talk about this one. Um, so a lot of you have actually requested classes from Todd, Paul, and I on how do we deal with complicated people, complicated <laughs> agents, complicated clients. What do we do? So there is a nine hour class <laughs> being taught here at Snedra on difficult buyers, difficult sellers, appraisers, agents, and others. So as much as Todd and I would love to teach you in 30 minutes on a Monday talk or at a sales meeting, this is your class. So May 13th. That's awesome. I didn't know that that was coming up. Because yeah, we do get that. Well, we do. And you describe it. That's right. Uh, Friday. So yeah. Friday. So. Will drinks be served? <laughs> Bring your own. <laughs> Not on this, audits for education. I am talking to you guys who are here right now. You're like the best because you guys show up and you do everything right. And you know what? You miss some of your education. Some of our best agents who are like on top of it miss their education and getting audited and getting a little fines and the hand slapped and things like that. So it can happen to you. Please look at how many credits you have right now, and if you're like, oh, where are my credits? Who's got those? Huh? Put them all on your desktop, in a little folder, put them in, whatever. You be in control. Smedra keeps them, yeah, that's great. But you, you need to see them in front of you and stay on top. And we all know you have to do the mandatory every year, and you have to have 12 more hours of elective. But trust me, some of our really good agents are getting on and they're like, ah, oh, this is buy a, a class or two. We had one agent who had more than enough, but four hours were not accredited because the, the class he took, the lender didn't stay on top of keeping their class accredited with door. So he turned them all in, I got them all, I'm all good. And they're like, this one wasn't good. Oh, how am I supposed to know? They actually have a link. You can go on and see if your classes are actually worthwhile and are accredited. Know if you're doing Banet, Thrive, Symmetra, NAR, you're good. But if you're going for a lender, if they drop the ball and don't stay on top of keeping their class accredited, your class isn't any good. They were very nice to rage, they didn't do anything mean to them. But they did make, make it up, and he didn't get in trouble, trouble. But he was stressed out. Because you, you, like I said, you guys are the, the good ones, you're here. And you get stressed out when the door's like, you're not on top of it. So please, education, stay on top of it. Because I've already seen one of them, or someone's behind it. Special awards and recognition. First off, to you, hopefully you guys all know, you know uh, Irish Bowman per agent in Smedra. That pad is out of a lot of offices. Now this is 250 agents and above, so that's a smaller number of offices because we are one of the larger offices. 
but you guys did over 1.5 billion dollars in sales. 1.5 billion. That's over 5 million per agent. That's ridiculous amount of business and volume. High volume. I've never seen so many million dollar, three million, five million dollar transactions. So not only do you guys do a lot of business, you do a lot of high end business. So you should feel feel very proud that yeah, you're like you're in the game. You are the game. You won the game. So congratulations. And then April Award winners. So Power Pro Award winners. Sandra Shaler, top sale value. Six transactions and three. There we go. And three point seven. That's the one about three point seven. You want to know how we did an average of five million per agent for the year? In one month, she has three point seven. Amazing. Derek Danbo, four transactions. Derek was here. I was here. Congratulations. I will just read the names. We'll clap as much as you want here at the end. Kate Latran, four transactions. Woo! Four transactions. The Jew, four transactions. And then Kipto, three transactions. Mark Baker, three transactions. Aaron Weinsapple, three transactions. And Aaron Weinsapple's been battling some health issues. He's been with us from like day one. Uh, and he's doing really well. Tamara Aspen, three transactions. Kiefer Mansfield, three transactions. And the rest, Power Pros with two in the month. Wendy Chris, Greg Tiffin, Kara Over, Jonathan Hammond, back there, who's our newer agent. Congratulations. Ricky Mark Lee, Monesh Wagle, Gary Bloom, Lillian Mahara, John Holm, Anna Milani, and Antoinette DeGeorge. Congratulations. Great bump. I feel like we have another award. We do. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I have other stuff to give. What are my other things? Right here? No, I've got them over here. Here's like, I, I got more. I have more words to I'll change to Stacy here. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, there you go. Perfect. Awesome. So, we've got four awards to announce, one person in attendance today. Oh, we only have one. Okay. So, yeah. And you can progress with what the award is. What the award is. So, this is on Jenny. <laughs> I should put that word in there. I feel like I have to walk Jenny in this industry. Uh, but no, with equity, we're, we're just really, really thankful, grateful to those of you that have been with us for a long time, stick with us, uh, support us. Um, you mean a lot to us. And this is in grateful appreciation for your 10 years loyalty and dedication, Karina. So this is Ray Cruz Solano, so thank you, Ray. And then final. Ah, no one. Yeah, another amazing game. So congratulations for your longevity. Yeah, and then we have several of you in the room that are We'll be reaching your 10th yes. anniversary throughout this year, so be on the lookout. We'll have more awards this fall that we're giving out as well. So. That is it for the awards. So coming soon, listing. Does anyone have a list? <laughs> we have listings. Let me actually, the inventory is rising, so we have something to talk about. Please stand here, the beach, because you guys don't talk as loud as I do. Hi, I'm Dominic. Uh, I have a listing here in four bedrooms, four baths. Free car garage, um, 
it, the address is 1973 Lord Court. Uh, it will go live next week. It will start showing this next weekend. And uh, I'm listening to it for five minutes. Anybody else? Or maybe we'll just. I'll pass it. I can talk about it. Can you talk about it? Yes. I'm in Allison Lashman, uh, 720 I have a new listing starting, showing start Friday in Highlands Ranch. Address is 2185 Thistle Ridge Circle. Five bedrooms, four bath, finished basement over a 12,000 square foot lot. It's in a cul de sac, high lot. It is like the best flat yard in Highlands Ranch for cornhole, play sets, trampolines, um, a flagstone patio with a built in fire pit. Please bring your buyers. It's listed at $8.99. We want this one to go quickly. So bring it, bring a buyer, bring some money, and we let it <laughs> 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 Someone else, Steve? Uh, Steve and Kathy Harper, we have a listing coming up in Evergreen. Mr. Holm is very familiar with this property. 27086 Mountain Park. It is a lovely, lovely home. Uh, four beds, three baths, uh, lovely mountain setting, amazing contemporary uh, mountain. Both beds will be on the market by the end of the month, about a million. Three million three five somewhere in that point. Price point. We also have them coming up out in Tinker Valley, uh, right at the end of the month. It'll be closer to about uh, seven fifty to eight hundred. It's a four bed, three bath, and it sits in the valley. And possibly um, listing in Littleton near Kevin. It's essentially of bowls. Sims. Sims. Yeah, that would be about 750. Yes. What's the address of the one in the valley? The one in the valley is. Fort Tacoma. Fort Tacoma. Yeah, it sits on a cul de sac, Max, nice large lot. She's just going through some updating right now. We'll get it ready by the end. Steve and Kathy are, if you need more information, we'll go and then we'll go. I have several, <laughs> which is good. Um, I have a condo at um, the Waterford, unit 706, two bedroom, two bath, en suites. Totally updated, remodeled, beautiful piece of property. Um, I have one up in Westminster. Um, most likely will be under contract though this week, which is good, but it's a three bedroom, two bath, um, a smaller home, uh, 549.9. I have. Yeah, how much was Oh, the Waterford 795 right now. And then I have one in Cap Hill uh, going online next week. It'll go for 320, one, be um, one bedroom. It's about 700 square feet. It's beautiful, but it's, it's amazing and it's good to go fast too. So bring your buyers. Hi, stand, if you can stand, then we can hear you better. I'm Carrie Walker. Um, my future also in California, and I'm selling a spider facility. I'll say this: um, I'm selling a family investment property or a second home in Mission Beach, and I'm going to have some buyers that want to go to Beach or have an investment property. Um, it currently makes about seventy grand to one hundred grand a year. Um, great incomes. It is redone from the stud out, three bedrooms, three bathrooms. It's literally 50 steps to the bay, two and a half miles to the ocean. Um, all lots of great walkability. Um, it's 815 Mormon, O R M O N T. It is not on the market yet. Um, I will be listing it. And you can always get a hold of me on Facebook or call me if you are interested. I'm uh, coming soon, and I will give a good report. Price? Oh, sorry, not point seven. Affordable. <laughs> <laughs> Comparatively, that's affordable. <laughs> Julie. Uh, I'm Julie Wilson. I am coming soon. It'll be hopefully on the market next weekend. It's going to be in Plenty Goals, the golf course community. <laughs> <laughs> it is a uh, $55 because it's going to be listed on 
around the 725 and so 32. Anyone else? I think that's it. I think that's a wrap. Other than we still have food. It was great seeing you guys. And if you have any referrals or need any help down in the springs, we do have Wendy Bailey and her crew here. Wendy is the manager down in Colorado Springs for Equity. Say hi to her and the gang and Rita, who is her all down there. So yeah, it's nice for them to come up and see Scott and see us. But it was great seeing you guys. We miss you. Yes, thank you. And let's win this again next year. That was pretty cool. <laughs>